Arthur Herbert Hazeldine, mm-hmm. A-R-T-H-U-R, H-E-R-B-E-R-T, Hazeldine, H-A-Z-E-L-D-I-N-E. How do you pronounce it again? Hazeldine. Hazeldine. All right, so what is your birthday? 24th of May, 1934. 24th of what? May, May. 1934. 34, so how old are you now? Well, I'll be 85 in May this year. You are the one of the youngest Korean War veteran. <laughs> well, it's a miracle I survived, so. <laughs> <laughs> and where were you born? I was born in a place called Reefton on the west coast of the South Island of New Zealand in the South Pacific. So what's, could you spell that place? Reefton is R E E F T O N. F-T-O-N. It was a gold mining town at one time. Hmm. So when you were a child, was there any gold mining business going around? There was a, what they call a stamp mill there, a crushing mill hmm. that crushed quartz to get the gold out of. Most people called it what you call a white elephant. <laughs> In other words, there wasn't a heck of a lot of gold come out of it. But they are still mining gold there today. I see. And tell me about your family background, your parents and your siblings when you were a child. Well, my hero was my mother's brother, who was a Spitfire pilot in the Battle of Britain. And he later came out, he flew Spitfires in the Battle of Britain. Mm. Then he came out and fought against the Japanese in hurricanes in Burma. What about your siblings? My family, yeah. it was, I had two sisters, well, three sisters, sorry, was a younger one, mm-hmm. and one brother, who's late brother, I'm the only boy alive in that family. And what about school you went through? Yes, I, I started school at a little place called Cape Foulwind, which is south of Westport on the west coast of the South Island. And I went to school when I was actually still four years of age. Four? It had to be five, yeah. Hmm. But the, he, the master of the school, it was a one-teacher school, he said I was advanced enough to go to school, so I ended up going to school a year <laughs> early. At the age of four? Yeah. What did you learn there? I learned how to draw pictures on a blackboard and <laughs> count beads and stuff like that. So only one teacher in the school? Yeah. How many students were there? Oh, maybe 18 or 20, something like that. And all mixed of ages, right? Yeah. So how come all these different grades are learning together in the one classroom? Well, that's what it was like in New Zealand in those days. So had these country schools, which was a country school. And just incidentally, talking about that now, Mm -hmm. some of the boys in that school who used to make toy ships and everything for me, went away in the Second World War. Second World War? Yeah, not many of them came back. Yeah. Those, you know, this just comes up when I'm thinking about that. Mm. Mm. So then, when did you finish your school? Oh, it must have been, let's see. I can't remember. How old were you? I was 15. So that was in 1949. Yeah, 48, 49. That's when I joined the Navy. I left school to go straight into the... Well, I signed up for the Navy and went in the following year. And why did you join the Navy? Well, it was because after the war, the, the New Zealand Navy sent ships around the country and... I'd been to one of the corvettes that had come back from the war, Mm. been shown over it by the Navy fellas, and the captain of that ship was later recruiting in my hometown. Mm. And that was quite funny, actually, because it was in the town hall in Westport, and they had this sign out, recruiting for the Navy, you know. And I just stuck my head in to see what was going on, and I recognised this captain who was captain of this corvette. Mm-hmm. And he sort of saw me and asked me what I wanted to do, what I was looking for. 
And I said, oh, I'm just wondering what's going on. Hmm. So not very long after that, we got talking and I ended up signing up for the Navy. <laughs> so where did you get the basic military training? At, at a place called Motorhee in the Gulf in Auckland. Could you spell it? It's M-O-T-A-H-I. Okay. And, and what then at the Devonport Naval Base, Philomel. What kind of, uh, what kind of uh, training did you get? Well, it was all the basic training, learning, marketing and all that physical training. And then we started going into our special jobs like learning about gunnery and navigation. And I went literally back to school. What do you mean? Well, they took us back and we had to learn mathematics and everything like that. And I learned quicker there than I did when I was actually at school. <laughs> so that was better? Yes. Yeah. Because we under, everything we did it had a purpose, you know. Yeah. Because we had to learn to navigate. Yes, that's why you have to learn. Yeah, to learn the So that you can learn about navigation. Yes. Exactly. That's a very good point. Mm. Yeah, you have to be practically oriented, right? Mm. Yes. So from there, where did you go? Well, I got my first ship. This was in the early 1950s, and there was a general strike in New Zealand. General strike? Yes. Mm -hmm. The drivers, the railways, the seamen, the coal miners had a general strike, all on strike. And the, the prime minister of the day, Sidney Holland, he called a state of emergency and brought the military in. At that time, I was taken, I got my first ship called HMNZS Bologna. She was a Dido class cruiser working the wharves in Wellington. That's a frigate. No, no, it was a cruiser. Cruiser, sorry. And we were taken by rail down to Wellington. Mm -hmm. We were only seamen boys at the time. And we, we looked after the ship while all the crews worked the ships coming into Wellington because all the Navy and the Air Force and the Army were loading and unloading ships and running the railways and the trucks and all that sort of thing. And my ship later was Taupo, but we get to that. So when did you leave for Korea? In late 1951, uh, yeah, 51. And... Where did you arrive in Korea? That within a couple of months we we went straight. Where did you arrive? Where? Yeah. Kure. That's the Japan. So from Japan. Oh, we went. To, we patrolled the east coast of Korea. Okay. So that was in nine, late 1951 or 52. No, 51. Late 51. Before Christmas, we had Christmas up there in the <laughs> snow. And you went to the patrolling the Korean seas. Off the Korean coast from West. Vladivostok in Russia, Sonjin, and right down the east coast. That was our first patrol. And? Yeah, and then? Well, we were stopping, there's a, if you know, being Korea, that there's a railway line that comes down from Manchuria yes. through Sonjin down the coast. But we were beating up trains and knocking down bridges and stuff like that all along there. So by bombing from the sea? Yes. Ah, tell me about it. Both tell me us. the detail. When did it happen and how did it happen? Well, the, the, the actual dates I'm pretty vague on. But our job was to stop ammunition trains and stuff getting south. And my job on the ship was to direct the gunfire. I have a set of headphones and I receive uh, messages from the gunnery officers on the bridge and I relay that to the guns. So what do you call that? Well, Navigation gun or? Gun direction. Gun direction. I control two Bofors. They fire 120 rounds a minute, 40 millimeter. Mm. So you were good at it, gun direction? Well, I could, all I had to do was say P1 Engage that sandpan or engage that junk. I see. Or kill that man. <laughs> <laughs> and how successful was it? 
very successful. I think we'll come to that. Tell me. Where Yangdo, where Yangdo is, you, you, that's one of the islands on the west coast. Pongyangdo. Pongyangdo is on the west coast. Yeah. This is on the east coast. It was Yangdo. Yangdo. We were patrolling one night off Sonjin, and we got a radio message from Yangdo that they were expecting an imminent invasion. The, uh, they were being shelled from the mainland and they were expecting to be invaded. So we had to, our ship wasn't a very fast ship, it was a frigate, HMNZS Taupo it was called. So you were in the cruiser, but later you changed it yeah, to Yeah, well frigate? I went from there to Taupo, or went to the work on the wharves mm. in Westport. That's another story, we got a bit sidetracked there. We'll go back there because I think it's important. The ship I joined was the Taupo then. Uh, my uncle owned the Reefton coal mine and I was sent down to instruct people on how to put coal tubs on clips and all that. That was all part of the working of it. Yeah. And if anybody wanted to know anything, they would ask Old Bill, which was my uncle, or Young Bill, which was me. And from then on in the Navy, even from the Admiral down, they all called me Young Bill. Mm. But to get back to the actual action there, they were being shelled and we travelled down there and we arrived about two in the morning, middle of winter, and there's breaking ice through there at the time, and uh, an invasion force have, had come across the channel and were, they were held, being held on the beach by the rock troops. But when we got there, we couldn't do much about it because if we'd have started firing in there, we'd be killing our own people. So we spent a couple of hours just firing star shell that were coming down so that the rock troops could kill these people that had come ashore. Mm. And it went, we, the firing stopped for a while and we, we moved out a little bit in between the channel and the mainland until the, it was just breaking day when a whole fleet of these sampans towed by junks full of troops tried to get back to the mainland. And we caught them in the middle of the channel. And remember I said the Bofa fires 120 rounds a minute. Mm -hmm. 40 miller grazed fuse. It's only got to touch something and it explodes. So you imagine what it was doing to those people in those boats. Yeah. So... That should have been very critical because by bombing them so that there is no logistics supply to the North Korean soldiers, right? No, well the thing was, they had just come out and tried to invade the island but they couldn't get ashore. And when we came along, we were just illuminating them. But they, the South Koreans must have been pushing them back because they got in their boats and were trying to get back. We caught them in the middle of the channel and I'd never seen a dead body up until that time. And then I saw bodies that I wouldn't want to see again. They gave oh. me nightmares. Because mm. those shells just blew everything to pieces. Yeah. So it must be very powerful bombing. Yeah. yeah. And as it, the sun was coming up, it was, or it was becoming daylight, their flashes from their shore batteries that they'd been using to bombard, we, they wouldn't be easy to detect. So they started firing at us and the shells started to come over us and a lot of, because the tide was taking the current through the channel, was bringing a lot of these junks and sampans out towards us and the first thing we sort of noticed was it was bullets bouncing off the paintwork because the soldiers in the junks were firing at us. and. Once they'd killed most of the troops in the sandpans of being towed by the junks, there was just a few left in one particular junk that got close to us. And it had, oh, I don't know, there must have been about 20 or 30 soldiers on the deck. And they were firing rifles at us. But a few more shells went into them and killed a lot of them. But one particular man... How did you know that 
actually the bombing killed so many people. We could see them. See? They were just blowing them to pieces, yeah. Oh, it was so close then. Yeah, well, it was close enough for rifle fire to bounce off our paintwork. Huh. But and uh, we hadn't any, had any incoming at that time in the early part. And I remember one particular soldier was standing up on the wheelhouse of this junk and he had a rifle in his hand and he was firing rounds and the, one of my gunners put another round into the junk and the, the man on the, on the uh, wheelhouse put his hands up oh. with his rifle above his head oh. and the gunner stopped firing. I get a message on my headphones to kill him. And of course, the guy on the gun, he said, I can't, he's got his hands up. Then a voice came over the loudspeakers, it was our captain. Mm. And he, he sounded like a pirate captain. He just says, kill him, kill him. And next thing, one of the rounds hit this soldier in the middle and he just evaporated. Oh, that was... Oh, must he, have been awful. Oh, it was terrible because there was a lot of... In the water at that time, as you'd know, they only last about five minutes and you're frozen to death. And these, a lot of these people have been blown out of the boats and they've been blown to pieces, you know. Did you know anything about Korea before you left Korea? I knew that there was things happening because my grandmother used to read out of the paper that she said the American... She came in one day and she said, shows the headline on the paper, the USA says hands off South Korea. That's before they actually before the Chinese came into the war. Mm. And uh, that's what I, I didn't know a lot about it. And when I signed up to join the Navy, I sort of, it was vague. The only thing I'd known about war was our family in the war in Britain and around there. So when did you leave Korea? I left in uh, a couple of years later. A couple of years? 1953 or 52? Be end of, no, beginning of 53. Beginning of 53. Mm. And before you leave Korea, were there any other episodes that you remember? Oh, well, we, we were taken over, and uh, one of our other frigates took over from us, and we went down to Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and we, uh, you all right? Yeah. Went down to Hong Kong, and we took all the ammunition off our ship, which turned out to be quite funny later, to come back to New Zealand. And we were left Hong Kong and we were heading out to New Zealand. We got a signal that a ferry coming from Macau to Hong Kong had been boarded by pirates. So we went out there to help. And uh, anyway, uh, we found the ferry and apparently people had been taken off. These pirates had taken some people off the boat. Yeah. And... Uh, and a gunboat from Taiwan arrived on the scene. And of course, remember, we've got no ammunition on the ship. They're training their gun on us and we're training our gun on them. And we, have, we don't even have any ammunition. Yeah. So we got a signal from this Taiwanese gunboat and it read, go home, English dogs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and our, we sent a signal to them, we're not English, we're New Zealand. So. <laughs> Right away it came back, go home, sons of English dogs. Yeah. So we went home. So when did you go back to Korea? Three years ago. So it must be 2016? No, but a year before that. 2015? Yeah. Did you go back to Korea? Yeah. Who invited you? Oh, we were invited by the South Korean Patriots, I think. Yeah. South Korean government, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when you went back to Korea and see, what did you see? A whole new country. <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, when we left there, there was no trees or anything standing. The whole place was... Did you see some cities? You were in the sea, right? You never seen the oh, cities. We used to see quite a bit from the shore. We had big, powerful binoculars yes. up above the bridge. Ah. I used to say they would see people changing their mind 20 miles away. Mm. We used those to look at the bridges and the tunnels and stuff and to find the trains. 
Actually, we went right into San Jin Harbour one night. Yes. Darkened ship, no lights. Right into the harbour. I think we sunk a little freighter at the wharf there, knocked down a big factory chimney and got out. And there was gunfire going on for quite a while after we'd left. So I think they might have been shooting at each other across the harbour. And when, when, when you go went back to Korea, what, what, what did you see? Well, I saw all the new buildings and, and the, the, all the gardens and the, I've never seen so many plastic plant houses in my life. <laughs> and I went on the, the bullet train mm -hmm. from Seoul down, right down to Busan or Busan. Yes. I think we reached the speed of about 300 kilometres an hour at one part. What a fantastic railway. Mm. Mm. And in Seoul itself, there's a big hill in the middle of the city there, isn't there? They told me that's a rubbish dump that was covered over and planted in trees. Fantastic. Mm. But the thing that impressed me was the railway line. Where there was a hill, they went through it, or they moved it into the galleys, and they made a high-speed railway line. And we're trying to just keep our rail going here. So when you left Korea, had you imagined that Korea would become like this today? No, I wouldn't have a clue on it. But there's a vast difference between South Korea and North Korea. Yes. When you go over to the demilitarized zone and see what's happening over there mm -hmm. on the other side. What do you see the difference? Yeah. So you never imagined that Korea would become like this today? No, I didn't. I had no idea. You didn't have any idea? No. Do you know the rank of Korean economy now? Oh, I know it's pretty, pretty high. The number and, you, and you don't import much. You manufacture. Yeah, we export. That's right. Yeah, export, export, export. <laughs> and you grow food where even in right into the cities. Yes. Everywhere. Yeah. There's a bean plant or a corn plant or anything. And do you still have that holiday to plant a tree, each family to plant a tree? Yeah. Shingmogil, which is the day of uh, tree planting. And we do that. And we are one of the most successful country that implemented uh, successful forestation, reforestation. So there were not many trees when you were there, right? <laughs> Hardly ever see one. They make a dog nervous. They right. fiddle on the tree. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So how about Korean people when you were there? How do they treat you? Oh, excellent. Tell me. Well, they're very friendly. And, and of course, we didn't associate with them much when we were in the war because we were on the sea. But I did... At, you were talking about uh, Pongyang Do. That had a the beach they use as an airstrip there because there's a big high tide there and there's a big long clear mm -hmm. area. Well, we associate a lot of the people there because there was a fishing or well, on Yang Do there was a fishing village, and we used to tow the boats back there to keep them out of the war zone, mm. and we. Uh, at the Yang, the, uh, the Yangdo action, we took 13 wounded off there. One of them died during the night and we buried him at sea. Oh. But there was young people, only much younger than me, with guns fighting for their country. And our job was to look after these fishing boats. And they, they don't seem to understand law. They just go where they wanted. <laughs> And if they, night comes, they just let the boat drift and they go to sleep. We used to have to wake them up by firing a machine gun around the boat. And we, I know we took about, oh, I think half a dozen of them in tow in one day. And we thought they were either North Korean or enemy ones, but we towed them back to Yangdo. And when they got to, their, to Yangdo, all the families were cheering and shouting because they belonged there. We thought they were from North Korea. So there were many actions in your ship. Right? Yeah. Yeah. 
what was the most difficult thing, if I ask you to pinpoint one thing that really bothers you during the war, what is it? Well, it was that action at Yangdo because there were so many people killed and blown apart. I mean, when you're firing at an enemy a distance away, they're not really people, are they? Mm. But when you see them blown to bits in the boat with phosphorus burning in the flesh and some of them are still alive, it's terrible. You still remember those? Does that appear in your dream? Nightmare? Oh. How often? Oh, I have it quite often. I still get it. So you have a PTSD? A which? Post-traumatic. Well, I suppose it is. I don't know what you call it. Hmm. So what is the symptom when you have that nightmare? Is, do you just wake up or do you yell or what do you do? Sometimes I yell. I don't really know. But I'm telling people where to fire. I've found myself, I've woken up telling the gunnery where to shoot. So looking back all those years, what do you think about what happened to you? Why you didn't know anything about Korea well, no. but now you are the Korean War veteran. And what do you think about this whole thing? Well, since then, I've been in another war. I was in the Suez Crisis. But I think it was a waste of life. That's basically what I think. There's no really... Don't hear a lot about it, but mm -hmm. let's say I'm glad I helped the little people. Yes, yes. Because of that, now we had a chance to rebuild our nation. We are eleventh largest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that? It's larger than, bigger than, and stronger than New Zealand economy. Oh, of course it is. We were only a little pimple. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that is the importance of the Korean War, but still, it's been known as a forgotten war. Yeah. Why is that? I mean, South Korea, strong economy, strong democracy came out of after the war. So there are successful outcome there is, but we still don't talk about it. Why is that? I don't really know. I think... When you think about it, you just follow the money. Mm. The, uh, the, a lot of the soldiers in the demilitarized zone, when they salute, what do they say? Unification. Mm. When are we going to get that? I don't know. I me. thought we were getting it a while back. I've been to that place where they crossed over there, just a little piece of concrete. Yeah. yeah. The Panmunjom. Yeah. Yes. What were you thinking? The war that you fought for still going around, never finished with, That's right. uh, and replaced by the peace treaty at all. So what no, do you think about No, we've never, that? we're still at war, with, uh, as far as I'm concerned, New Zealand is still at war with China. We've never signed a peace treaty. Mm -hmm. And to see people, families separated like that's wrong. Yes, that's right. So you have your grandchildren, Child, grandson, right? His name is Jeremy. Yeah. Can I ask him to join this if interview? If you like, yeah. Jeremy, come down. Have a seat right beside your grandfather, great grandfather. Grandfather or great grandfather? Grandfather. And let me ask you turn toward me. Toward me, toward me. Turn right. Yes, yes. And that that's it, that's it. What is your name? Jeremy. Lame. And how old are you? I'm 25. 25. While you were growing up, have you heard anything from your grandfather about the war that he fought for? Did he yeah. tell you? What did he tell you? Um, he, told, he told me about um, when you first joined the Navy and then how we went over to Korea and yeah, basically what he's been telling you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did he tell anything about the battle experience to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you know about South Korea right now? 
Yeah, I've got I've got a rough idea about what's going on over there. Yeah. What is your rough idea? Um, they're still pretty much at war with each other, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Not allowed in each other's countries and stuff like that. Still yeah. divided. Yeah, still yeah. divided. Yet. Yeah. And Trump, President Trump, and Kim Jong Un, the mm. North Korean leader, are talking about, you know, having breakthrough. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Um. Trump. I think he. It's hard to say really because I'm yeah well we just in New Zealand so we we only hear a little bit of it but yes. President Trump, I think he's just trying to. I think he's tr uh, trying to sort it out, sort of, <laughs> but um. He's a bit proud at the same time. I think he's just trying to make a name for himself. Yeah. A bit more than what he's already got. Yeah. <laughs> but um. Yeah. What do you know about Korean economy, South Korean economy? No, you don't know? No, not really, no. You know that South Korea has a Samsung, which produces mm. the yeah, smartphone? Samsung. Yeah. Yeah, you know about it, right? Yeah. And Hyundai producing vehicles, automobiles. Honda. Yeah, yeah. Hyundai. Oh, Hyundai, yeah. Yeah, yeah. not Honda. Honda is yeah, Japanese. Japanese. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So are you impressed with the Korean economy? Yeah, well, yeah, Honda, yeah. yeah. But... As you just overheard from your grandfather's interview, mm. there was nothing in Korea in 1953. Yeah. Nothing. Virtually nothing, right? Are you... Complete. Completely nothing. Absolutely nothing. As I said, there wasn't even a tree standing that I could see. <laughs> and then now it's the 11th largest economy in the world, stronger mm. than New Zealand economy. What yeah. do you think about this whole transformation? I think it's good, yeah. It's positive. Very positive. Yeah. But when you're growing up in your school, did you learn anything about the Korean War from the school? We were, at primary school, we more focused on the First and Second World War. We never really heard anything about the Korean War. You never? Well, yeah, I wasn't really good in school, but yeah, from what I can remember, mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was more the First and Second World War mm. that we spoke about, yeah. So... What do you think about this, Arthur? We don't teach. So your own no. grandchildren are not learning from the school about the war that you fought for. Well, it doesn't surprise me that if even the national people who were in government last year, they still deny anything about those sort of things. And we've had, in the meantime, we've had nuclear bomb tests that have killed most of my friends. Mm. And the Suez crisis, which our, our government still says we were never there. Well, I was there because I fired the guns to drive off motor torpedo boats that was trying to torpedo the ship we were, mm. that we were escorting with all the fuel on it and ammunition and everything. Yeah. That's so another story. Yeah. The history textbook doesn't cover about the Korean War, right? Yeah. Jeremy, how many sons do you have? What's their name? Safira and Noah. Ah. Do you think that they will learn about Korean War from their own school? Not from the school, no, but they'll definitely hear about it from me. Yes. Yeah. And they will hear from, directly from their great-grandfather, right? Yep. Why? Because we keep this interview. Yep. And Jeremy, we're going to make this interview into curricular resources like this. This is the lesson plan book for yep. the teachers. Can you, could you read it? What is it? Korea's place in teaching world history. Yes. Could you show the book to the camera? Yes. Korea's place in teaching world history. We made it for the teachers in the United States, but we hope that we can make same thing, the Korean War and its legacy using this interview here in New Zealand, so I'm in contact with the scholars and professors and teachers yep. who can write it up, okay? What yep. do you think? I'm happy. Yeah, so that yep. your, te your children can learn from. Yep, I'll buy it. <laughs> yeah. So yep. could, you, could you make sure that you teach your children about the war that mm -hmm. your grandfather fought? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Yep. Mm. Yep. Anything you want to say, Jeremy, to your father, grandfather? Thank you.
and I'm I'm happy to have a grandfather that that's that can that can talk to me about this sort of stuff because not not many uh, guys my age are privileged enough to have a grandfather or you know a grandparent that's fought in the war, mm-hmm. so that I can pass it down to my kids and let the cycle can uh, like you know let it continue because things like this just they just get pushed off to the side as time goes on and just forget get forgotten about and then people don't realise you know well, like what really went on back in the day sort of thing like it's still going on now but things like that shouldn't be forgotten about because it is a big thing beautiful isn't it Arthur you can call me Bill too if you like <laughs> <laughs> Bill aren't you glad that you brought your own grandson Jeremy I only hope he doesn't have to do what I did Exactly. We don't want to promote the war, but we want to learn from the war, okay? Mm. And that's why we are doing this. And I'll give you my business card, Jeremy. Yep. You can find lots of lots of Korean War veterans interview from the website. Yep. And your grandfather's interview will be uploaded to the same exact website. Sweet. Okay? Yep. All right. Is there anything else that you want to say to me? No, I think we just about covered it, but as I said, there was, it, from my point of view, in 53, uh, I went to Britain mm-hmm. and then came back again and went again to pick up a new ship, which was one of our last ships, mm-hmm. the Royalist, which was, I think they were at the ceasefire, New Zealand ship Royalist. Well, I got her del- when we were, she was completely refitted and commissioned into the New Zealand Navy, left Britain and went into the Suez crisis. Mm. And we were pulled out of there, but I think they were frightened, uh, our government was frightened of being taken to the World Court for aggression with the British. But that's another story. So next year will be 70th anniversary of the breakout of the Korean War never been replaced with the peace treaty either. What would you say to the Korean people? Do you have any special message to the Korean people? I was at the 1960, uh, the, the 60th year, mm-hmm. I was at that, we went there to... 60th com- anniversary, yeah, to yeah, commemorate, armistice, yes. Yeah, to commemorate the armistice. But uh, I could say just keep going, you're doing well, and I want to see that reunification. Great. Excellent, Bill. Thank you so much for your fight. And this is a great day because you talked to your grandson about the war that you fought, okay? So we'll make sure that we're getting back to New Zealand and educate our own history teacher here in New Zealand so that they can talk about the war that you fought. Well, while I was there, I didn't mention, but I had an uncle who was in the artillery on the land while I was on the sea. Oh, really? Yes. Ah, that's a great. Whole family were there. Well, before that, I had an uncle in the, he was, flew a Spitfire in the Battle of Britain. Yeah. And hurricanes in Burma, as I think I told yeah. you. But that's, they more or less set me on the, to join the military. Great. That great tradition. Mm. in your family. Thank you so much. You're welcome.